there's something surprising that I never thought I'd get to say. The very first Fire Emblem game ever made is officially playable in English. There were two reasons for that skepticism. For one, it seemed more likely they would simply remake the original onto the Echoes line or re-release one of its two remakes. The other, more controversy-soaked reason, is that it would mean giving credit to Shozo Kaga, who has a contentious history with Nintendo and Intelligent Systems. Kaga was the lead designer of the Fire Emblem series for nearly a decade, and while I am low to ascribe to auteur theory, especially in video games where it's such a collaborative effort, he did heavily influence the direction the series took up to that point due to the position that he held. Things did not end on friendly terms between Kaga, Intelligent Systems, and Nintendo, with Kaga leaving in 1999 to form his own company and, well, make Fire Emblem for the PlayStation. No, really, the first tier rank saga is just Fire Emblem with the thinnest coat of paint applied to it. It was basically the only Fire Emblem that you could get until, well, the Game Boy Advance. This prompted Nintendo to sue Kaga's company due to said similarities. And they won that lawsuit. Sort of, they won one of the appeals that they filed, but the court decided no, they couldn't actually prevent them from selling the game because it wasn't copyright. It's a story for another day. And in any case, you'll note that I said surprised and not excited, and there's a good reason for that. The first Fire Emblem game is more notable for its legacy than its merits as a game 30 years later. It was significant for making the genre of tactical role-playing mainstream and for representing a turning point for intelligence systems. At the time, they were more focused on development toolkits than making games, hence the name. That would change in 1987, when a concept was proposed by one Shozo Kaga. Kaga got a start in video games after winning a magazine coding contest and was, at the time, a designer at Intelligent Systems. He came up with the idea of combining the simulation of the then-new War series with a character-driven story. I call it role-playing simulation. It's new genre, basically it's a strategy game, but strategy games typically are kind of hardcore and dry. You only care about winning or losing the battle. And there's no space for the player to empathize with the characters or story. I love strategy games like that too, but I also love RPGs. By adding RPG elements, I wanted to create a game where the player could get emotionally invested in what's happening. Conversely, one of the drawbacks of RPGs is that there's always just a single protagonist. Thus, to a certain extent, you can only experience the linear story that the game creator has prepared for you. I wanted to create a game where the story and game will develop differently for each player depending on the units they use. Thus, I added the strategy elements and arrived at this hybrid system. I wanted to make a strategy game that was more dramatic, something where you would really be able to feel the pain and struggles of the characters. That's why characters can't be revived once they're killed, to impart a sense of gravity and seriousness. Bit of a tangent, but the first Fire Emblem game is one of the few games that you can actually revive units that have been killed. Probably was done because it was, again, a very new genre at the time. In turn, I think that the result is that the more love you have for your characters, the more rewarding the game is. It was this proposal that would take Kaga, the talented team over at Intelligent Systems, and Nintendo R&D 1, as well as the legendary Gunpei Yokoi, three years to turn this idea into an actual game. Side note, special thanks to Vince's ASM and XCon for translating the sketches from The Making of Fire Emblem 25th Anniversary Development Secrets and sharing the concept art from that book. Link will be in the description. Anyway, while Kaga wanted to combine strategy with role-playing to make a new type of game, the fact that this would involve strategic simulation at all presented a problem for everyone involved. According to then-programmer Tori Narihiro, the programming in a typical simulation game uses a lot of memory. Our game exceeded the capacity of the main memory available in the NES unit. So we figured out a way of increasing capacity by accessing a portion of the memory dedicated for saving the game. Using this memory, together with the main memory, we were able to get the game running. To display characters, we loaded a chip into the machine that was able to process and display kanji characters. Many of the technical limitations they faced would cause the team to scrap their more ambitious plans for the game. For example, they originally planned to use more extravagant graphics and cutscenes of certain events to compete with similar simulation titles on PC. Unfortunately, the MMC3 cartridge they needed to get the game to run on the Famicom only had a maximum capacity of 1 megabit, half the size of a typical Famicom cartridge, meaning they had to compress what they had and abandon any attempts to showcase cutscenes. Speaking of characters, there was originally supposed to be a second major dragon for Marth to fight, a water dragon named Neptune that was shelved due to the aforementioned minuscule capacity. Character moments like Jigen dying that were supposed to be pivotal moments in the development of Marth ended up being left on the cutting room floor, although a similar concept was pulled off in the DS remake. That same cartridge capacity complicated the campaign, 
as the team wanted there to be multiple paths for the protagonist to partake in. This was eventually scaled down to one map with two villages, where visiting one village to recruit the hero Samson or the paladin Aaron would prevent you from recruiting the one in the village that you didn't initially visit. Even the advertising filming the now infamous concert commercial came with its own sore spots. The armor that the actors were wearing, it wasn't some prop made out of cardboard, it was legitimately heavy like armor. It was so heavy in fact that they could barely keep standing. Oh, and the bright lights freaked out the horse on set, so everyone on set was having a bad time. There's a lot more behind the scenes trouble that we don't have time to delve into. Needless to say that those three years over at Intelligent Systems and Nintendo R&D 1 must have felt like an eternity. And living in the year 2020, I simply cannot relate to that concept whatsoever. Released on April 20th, 1990, Fire Emblem Onkonkuryu Tohekari no Surugi did not have the warm reception one might have expected given how highly regarded the series has been. In a 1994 interview with Famitsu, Shozo Kaga mentioned that every game magazine gave it pretty bad scores. There weren't really many games back then that combined the RPG and strategy slash simulation genres, you see. It stung to see it get so much criticism for being hard to understand or for not looking that impressive graphically. For those reasons, the reviews said it felt like some old game from yesteryear. A year later though, Nakashi praised Fire Emblem in the column of his for Famitsu. That was really when things started turning around, and the sales gradually picked up. While the claim as to what is the first tactical role-playing game ever made is… debatable, there is no dispute that the success of Fire Emblem is what popularized the genre of tactical role-playing and inspired countless other series, which is all the more impressive when you consider that the first game was never released around the world. Despite spawning 15 sequels, two of which were remakes of the original, a slew of spin-offs including a prequel on the Satellaview, a short-lived anime that did get an angle stub, Let them all go, but more. a manga adaptation, a card game, and re-releases on Nintendo Switch Online, the Wii, and Wii U Virtual Console, this particular entry has never made its way out of Japan. Until now, with Nintendo releasing Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light on Nintendo Switch for a limited time. We'll get to that later. So. How does this classic that spawned one of Nintendo's most revered franchises and a personal favorite of mine hold up over three decades later? Let's take a look at the very first Fire Emblem game ever made, Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light. The story opens with Seda relaying to Marth that pirates have invaded the land of Talos and have taken over her father's castle. Shortly after taking care of the bandits, Mars sets out with a few soldiers he can call upon to a relic to aid a princess in need named Nina and gather more forces to resist the ongoing war with the Dolor Empire. Together, they plan to restore Mars' homeland of Altea and fight back against the Dolor Empire, along with its allies of Grust, Gra, Macedon, the wizard Garneth, as well as the leader of the Dolor Empire, the Earth Dragon Medius, having risen once more after being slain by Mars' ancestor Henri a century ago. The story can be best summarized as constrained ambition. For its time, the premise was rather original. Most tales of the time would have prophesied the protagonist to save the world from some incoming threat, or have some foreign power invading a noble, but in the Blade of Light, that story has already happened, and Marshland has been occupied for years. Having our heroes starting out as exiles who must fight back and occupying largely human force makes it stand out, even if the writing isn't penned with the sharpest tip. Marth himself is not an especially interesting character, they're the stock heroic type, and the destined for greatness trope does still apply to him, seeing as he's the only one that can wield Falchion, the only weapon that can harm Medius, but the fact that they're waging a war of liberation is noteworthy in its own right, at least on paper. The execution is where it all falls apart. For a war that, spoiler alert for a game that's over 30 years old, goes off with so few setbacks for Marth and his army, their campaign is surprisingly messy and hard to follow. There are multiple chess pieces on the board, but it feels like we're missing a few moves between turns, or in some cases, like the event should be taking place in a different order. In Chapter 16, Marth is marshalling his forces at the capital of Altea to free the people from their oppressive ruler. It's only now, about two-thirds of the way through the game, that we learn that Marth has a sister. Something as personal as that should have been mentioned a few chapters ago. It would have made Marth more empathetic and provided a greater motivation to return to his homeland were it established earlier that he had a sister who may be alive but a captive of a grudge. As it stands, him mentioning that he has surviving family so late in the game is bizarre. I now understand why in yet another interview, Kaga said that Marth is not the protagonist. 
the campaign's events are so disjointed that it's really focused on Marth as a character. Part of why they're such a weak character is that we don't learn all that much about him as a person. It's the surrounding details that paint the picture of our protagonist rather than any actions he himself takes. It's less Marth partaking in the hero's journey than it is him being along for the ride. The pacing of said ride, by the way, is atrocious. It jumps around from one part of the map to the next with nary any connective tissue. Even if you go out of your way to visit every village to acquire every scrap of information that's tossed the player's way, it's hard to get a picture of the world of Akinea and not in a war breeds chaos, commentary on the state of warfare sort of way. Like other Fire Emblem games, the Blade of Light doesn't shy away from its glorification of imperialism and the divine right of kings. Marth is fighting to claim a throne by birthright after all. It's not as egregious as other entries, again, there's only so much nuance one can cram into the dialogue of a game, whose ROM takes up about the same file size as a picture of a puppy. That said, the chaotic campaign causes the player to be unable to garner a proper understanding of the world of Arcanea. The best games in the series do a great job of making the world that the cast occupy feel like a character unto itself. Reckon Oken and Three Houses are especially good in that regard. Speaking of the characters, the Blade of Light has a bad habit of throwing troops your way every few chapters with little in the way of details beyond their name. From a gameplay perspective, the constant recruiting of cavaliers, knights, and mercenaries makes sense since this game does feature permadeath, and thus these new units can substitute for one of your fallen. Granted, the way that Kaga designed his game, he always made these troops worse than the ones that you get starting out, but I digress. From a narrative perspective, this has the downside of having several superfluous characters spending precious dialogue sequences saying that they're joining you and contributing nothing to the story afterwards. Then again, some characters like Rad and Mars' initial troops, save for Jagan, don't even get any spoken lines when they're first introduced. This is not necessarily a problem exclusive to this game. Plenty of Fire Emblem titles focus on only a handful of characters, usually the Lord and their retainers, but they usually make up for their lack of relevance to the proceedings with additional dialogue shared between minor and major characters. There's support conversations, of course, but the Super Famicom trilogy that preceded that now standard inclusion has plenty of examples of minor characters interacting with one another as a means of making them more three-dimensional, even if their interactions don't necessarily advance the plot forward. The closest equivalent to that in the Famicom entries is that some of the enemy units that you can recruit need to be talked to by somebody other than Seda or Marth, so there's a back and forth with a given character trying to convince someone they know on the other side to cross the aisle. Other than that, any attempts to flesh out the cast and their relationships to one another are fruitless. What few that do bear some can be downright confusing when it comes to the unfolding of said events. In Chapter 19, an old Manakeet named Bantu reunites with a young girl named Tiki. While the relationship was established prior to this, he mentions Tiki when Marth first meets him, the events during said recruitment scene involve Bantu breaking Garna's mind control over her, which was not established in this chapter or any of the prior conversations about Tiki. In fact, Garner's dialogue within the chapter came across more like he was gaslighting her into thinking this wretched, wrinkly wizard was helping her, not that she was under his control. In spite of the lack of clarity pertaining to the reunion, Bantu and Tiki's relationship is charming and they are two of the only characters to have any bit of personality or depth to them, the only other ones being Nina, Seda, and Camus. Of those mentioned, only Camus comes across as fleshed out. They're not an all-time series great villain, but they exude far more nuance than one would normally expect from such an old game. And I can sing far more praises for him than some later villains in the series. In concept, Camus works as a dark reflection of Marth, someone so dedicated to seeing the flourishing of their country that they'll put aside their own happiness in life for that dream to happen. His relationship with Nina, although suffering from a bad case of show don't tell, does have a hint of tragedy to it. Granted, it helps that there's more set up for the relationship between Nina and Camus than there is for, say, Seda and Marth, the latter of which comes out of nowhere. We weren't privy to the relationship prior to this within the game, and the game doesn't have them interact in an intimate fashion with one another until the very end, so them becoming a pair feels completely unearned. Then again, the sequel to this game decided to pair up Nina with another character who didn't share any dialogue with her. The difference is that they established that character was fighting on their behalf for a while, so it's implied they at least know of one another, and the plot of that game actually uses the pre-established relationship of Camus and Nina to its advantage, leading to the downfall of one of the two characters in said relationship. Unfortunately, the limited amount of dialogue Camus espouses reigns in one's ability to be invested in said relationship and how much one can read into the character when there's so little writing to support any deeper observations. At the very least, there's more to say about them 
than there is for the other major villains. Garneth is your stereotypical evil wizard hell-bent on world domination, with nothing compelling nor entertaining to speak of, aside from their official artwork that makes him look like an inbred Namekian. The same goes for Medius. His Maneki design is unique compared to the other Dragonstone-wielding warriors, but the character himself is wholly unmemorable, and unlike Garneth, they don't interact with Marth until the penultimate chapter. The end of the penultimate chapter. Despite ostensibly being the game's big bad, the dastardly dragon whose actions set the stage for the conquering of Altea and Marth fleeing from his home, their presence is barely felt throughout the game, relying on being relayed just how vicious and mortifying a being they are. The only reason they could even be remotely described as menacing is because of their status as the final boss. As for the new localization, it's written in such a way that it comes across like a mostly authentic recreation of a localized role-playing game on the NES. Minus the memorable butchering of lines like, you spoony bard. There is one minor mistake that the localization team did make. Garnef tells Marth that he'll see him in hell, while Medius tells Marth that he'll send him straight to hell. Something that definitely wouldn't have flied under the censor-heavy Nintendo of the NES era were it brought over during that time period. The Blade of Light's plot and characters do not come together for a particularly satisfying narrative, but it's hard to penalize it too harshly when the game was sorely lacking space for dialogue. The same cannot be said for the gameplay. The Blade of Light is just about as standard as a tactic title as you can get, it being the game that inspired so many others and all. You take your turn between you and the AI, moving your units across a map, visiting villages and houses, attacking and healing as you approach the castle, and seizing it before moving on to the next map. Some units like Pirates and Pegasus Knights can move over terrain that others can't, some can use staves that work your units across the map, and some enemies can be recruited to your side. It's classic Fire Emblem all the same. If you're only familiar with the more modern era of Fire Emblem or even the earlier localized titles, there's a lot you have to unlearn before playing through the first game. The Famicom duology has an esoteric quality that's absent from later entries, like thieves not handing over treasure they stole once defeated. In Shadow Dragon and the Sword of Light, you just straight up lose whatever they nab from a chest, so best to warp over a unit who can guard a chest or two, just in case. Some of these quirks aren't difficult to adjust to. Former series staples like Same Term Reinforcements are completely manageable, if annoying given how this game handles them, we'll get to that later, but others like leveling up clerics through tanking attacks are decidedly more of a chore. Every other class is designed for combat, even the cleric's promotion, and they get experience based on how much damage they dealt or which enemy they felled. The cleric's job is to heal, yet they don't earn any experience from healing units, nor do they increase their weapon level through their primary practice. Meaning that if your primary healer bites the dust and you have to use a new cleric, and their weapon level is such that they aren't able to use the more advanced staffs, well, you better get grinding. Having to waste your time boosting the level up, only for them to, assuming they don't get the level ups they need for the staffs that they need to wield, be unable to promote for an inordinate amount of time is just frustrating if you don't know that beforehand. And I say that as somebody who did know that beforehand, speaking of promotions, some of the classes, namely the ones that wield axes, are unable to promote whatsoever. And while leveling up a unit that can't be changed from their base form is frustrating, they're not the only ones unable to change their classes, albeit for different reasons. You know, most players recommend promoting your units at around level 15. It depends on the game, depends on the class, depends on the characters, but it's usually done in order to make sure that you get the most out of their boost of their stats, additional weaponry, and in the games that they have them, new skills. That isn't really an option in the Blade of Light due to how rare these items are. Promotional items are exceptionally rare throughout the campaign, with only a handful to be found outside of a secret shop where you can buy them very late in the game. What few that are given to you don't get added to your inventory much earlier. There were several chapters where I already maxed out my unit's levels and was waiting for the next Paladin's Honor or Elysian whip to drop. You want to know the first time you even get a whip that lets you promote your Pegasus Knights into Wyvern Knights? Chapter 19. Chapter 19 out of 25 chapters. And by that point, assuming all your units are alive, you'll have three candidates to decide who gets a crack at riding a wyvern. Four of you grind up Est when dealing with the absurd amount of reinforcements from the previous chapter. Oh, and did I mention you only get two in the game? In, in the entire game? Unless you know the location of the secret shop where you can buy more? Then again, maybe they didn't want to make Manikeets completely overpowered since, for whatever reason, using a hero's crest on one of them will cause their defenses to increase by 12 points. 
and unlike the other times that they're used, they don't disappear from their inventory, so you can keep doing this until they have 99 defense points. This is only slightly broken. Fire Emblem is a perfectly balanced game with no exploits to be found, clickbait title. Replaying the original for the first time in years, I was reminded about how it wasn't hard, so much as the majority of the experience, is plagued by inconveniences. The way that you're forced to immediately stow away any item as soon as the character's inventory is full, if not drop one of your other items, is awful. And getting items shuffled from their pack to the convoy and back is a pain in the half, doubly so if you're on a map, when those second convoy to track. The user interface is equally painful, and if there's any challenge to be found in the original, it is derived from how little information the game gives you while you're trying to determine your next move. You might know each character's stats, their inventory, and who they're going up against, but the most important information is not given to you within the game. It doesn't tell you how much each weapon weighs, it doesn't tell you how much damage it will deal, and it doesn't tell you how any of these will affect your attack, i.e. if you're using a powerful weapon, but it's too heavy for you to attack twice, or if the enemy you're attacking is fast enough to be able to counterattack twice due to your choice of combat weaponry's covers and heft. The lack of a preview for one's attack is especially annoying when you're never sure how likely you are to be dealt or deal a critical hit, which makes it even more difficult to determine how dangerous an opponent is. Even if you're overtly familiar with series staples and what they do, it is nothing short of tedious trying to calculate what hit will do what damage, to see nothing of the likelihood of that hit connecting, to the point where I rarely bothered even doing so in the later chapters. A lot of the maps that these battles take place on are simplistic for lack of a better word. The objectives for all of them are the same, but some of them do shake up things by adding a side objective, some of which showcase some good ideas, even if they fall through in the execution when it comes to being challenging. Chapter 10, where you're forced to rescue Maria, the captive sister of Princess Minerva, is a perfect example of this. The map is designed in such a way, with most of the forces being Cavaliers and Pegasus Knights, that enemy forces will start to surround you, including Minerva herself, and you have to race to the ford where Maria is being held in order to prevent your troops from being flanked on both sides. It's not a hard map. Once you've gotten your troops past the stairs, you can simply turtle up and have a cleric heal whoever's taking attacks, but it does demonstrate a more creative approach to the usual recruitment scheme. Chapter 20's map is also rather decent. It features a two-pronged assault that forces you to split up your forces, wearing you down well before you're even approaching the main forces. And there's a village at risk of being robbed, so you have to carefully choose how you're going to quickly proceed since enemy reinforcements will shortly show up if you decide to take your time. It's one of the few times where the game requires actual strategy. Other maps show the contrast between the game's ambitions and its execution within the limitations of the Famicom. Chapter 19 comes to mind. The map is filled with a combination of foes behind doors, treasure troves, and thieves one would assume ready to plunder the former. Therefore, the challenge would appear to be to grab all the goodies tucked away in chests before the thieves can, or prevent them from opening up doors with enemies behind them. In reality, the thieves do not move a single space unless you're standing right next to them, and the locked up enemies are easily evaded, unable to open up the doors that hinder them from freely walking through the temple. The only thing that this map challenges is one's patience if they forgot to bring enough keys or thieves of their own to speed up the process, as well as dealing with the nuisance filled inventory system. Maybe the idea was to have enemies hiding behind closed doors and surprise the player, since this map revolves around opening them up in order to find the Light Sphere and Star Sphere, two plot critical items that are needed to defeat Garneth, but since we can already see them, the surprise is ruined and they're easy to pick off one by one. On the subject of stupidity, the AI is rather dumb. Players wielding Fortify will often cast it when nobody's injured, while other times they won't cast anything at all when there's several of their companions clinging to life. The lack of intelligence on display is also rather easy to exploit. Since they will always target Marth over any of his allies if he's within range, it's easy to march or teleport Marth in and have him sponge up a few hits if something goes awry. Even if one of your own is a point away from perishing, completely surrounded and unable to escape, the enemy's hellbent objective to destroy Marth if he's within sight supersedes simply finishing them off. Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light doesn't offer much in the way of an old school challenge beyond the inconvenience of restarting a given chapter courtesy of an unforeseen critical hit, which isn't a problem with this version of the game as we'll get into later. Most of its setbacks stem from annoyances than it does from presenting a challenging set of objectives, like how inconsistent the weapons that deal bonus damage to certain classes may be. Weapons like rapiers and armor slayers that deal extra damage to heavy units will work on generals, which is essentially a promoted knight. The same additional attack strength can be found when launching arrows, no matter the flying mount. But weapons that deal extra damage to cavalry like the Rider's Bane 
do not retain their effectiveness on Paladins, their promoted counterpart. While this does cut both ways in that your Cavalcade of Cavalry can attack without worrying about a Rider's Bane ending their life once they promoted, it also takes away one of your best tools for dealing with platoons of mounts when Paladins start to appear while Generals are still dealt with the same way as you would with a Knight. While we're talking about troops, that's another quirk about the original. How long reinforcements will keep coming? It's highly inconsistent. Some bots will see them show up for a few turns. Other times, they're arriving every turn and won't stop for a long time until turn 50. No joke, retaking the Altaian throne sees these same foes appear for over 40 turns unless you block them from spawning. This was likely done to allow the player to grind up any new units that they had to use to replace their ranks as a result of Permaneth, but on a map like this, where the corridor to reach their spawn spot is so tight, it's more tiresome when it comes to management, to keeping them from coming in, or using them as fodder to feed your raw recruits. There are some elements that I appreciate about Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, few though they may be. Having more characters than Seda and Marth being required in order to be able to recruit all the characters leads to some mild problem solving when it comes to trying to get close to these characters without getting killed or killing them. It's something from the older games that's been abandoned since Awakening that I sorely miss. It's also neat that, while the game sticks close to the usual knights, archers, and cavaliers of the fantasy setting, that they experimented with more unique classes like the Manakeets or the Shapeshifter Zane. Some will no doubt argue that this game is a product of its time and that it shouldn't be judged by modern standards. My rebuttal to that is that Nobunaga's Ambition, an older title within the tactics genre, holds up far better than the Blade of Light ever has. And I say that as somebody who's a far bigger fan of Fire Emblem than Nobunaga's Ambition. I mean, you don't exactly see a lot of Nobunaga's Ambition games on the desk, you know? Point being, no, I'm not going to give it the it's a product of its time excuse when there are not only better ways to get the same experience that the Blade of Light offers, but there are plenty of titles from around the same time period or earlier that hold up to this day like Tetris, Little Samson, and Super Mario Brothers 3! Even in the realm of role-playing games, the likes of Sweet Home, Ultima 4, Dragon Quest 3, and Dragon Quest 4 offer a sus and rebuttal to the common assumption that older titles within the genre don't hold up. The first Fire Emblem game deserves credit for its ambition and for showcasing quite a few interesting ideas when it comes to map design, character classes, and character recruitment, but it does not get a pass solely based on its legacy when playing it shows how the game is demonstrably hampered by the limitations of the Famicom. It was a bad game back in the day, not because it was the first of its kind, again, it's debatable as to what the first tactical role-playing game even is, but because it was frustrating and did a poor job of explaining its mechanics to the player. It failed to present them the necessary information to tackle the tasks that they were given, which made for an unwieldy and unwelcome experience for players whose first time with the tactics genre would have been this game. That so many quality of life improvements have come along in the next three decades go to further show how antiquated the game truly is. Honestly, the most amusing part of the first Fire Emblem game isn't even the game itself. It's the official artwork. No, really. This is the official artwork for Abel. Somebody got paid to make this masterpiece. This is amazing. As for this particular version of the game, there's not much more meat that's been packed onto its fragile, elderly bones. Like Super Mario 3D All-Stars, new additions and options are sparse. No interviews with anybody who worked on the game, no ability to play the soundtrack on its own, all you're able to do is speed the game up, rewind turns, or create a save state that can be reloaded if things go awry. All of these are fairly standard features one would find in a Famicom or NES emulator. In fact, you'd probably be able to create more save states than the solitary bookmark bestowed upon you in this particular release. Fast forwarding is also a double-edged sword since while it does speed up movement and waiting around for the AI to make their move, it ruins the one undeniable strong point that the game has going for it. Yuka Tsuchiyoko's terrifically composed tunes, which we'll get to momentarily. Additionally, the emulator has the occasional visual oddity when running the game. I had one instance where it would display unusual visuals when I recruited Roger, though this did go away when I entered the combat screen. It's also much darker than the original. To compare, here's footage from the first map that I captured using my original Famicom cartridge. The only alterations that have been made to this footage are cropping. This is how it looks completely raw. Here's what the Blade of Light looks like on the Switch. It's not so noticeable on a TV screen as to be distracting, but it can definitely be a problem if you're playing it on the go and have turned down the brightness on your Switch. If this is meant to be a celebration of the series, then it's a meager effort when you find more options in a free, standard Famicom emulator than you will in this paid game's options. 
Not to mention we probably run with less technical troubles. As Nintendo Switch Online has shown, the system is more than capable of running such an old game without a hitch. Yet, the Blade of Light is in a comparably shoddier state, while costing more than a month's worth of the former subscription. Oh, but I can change it to the original aspect ratio, yay! Speaking of appearances, the game's presentation may have been maligned for lackluster visuals back in the day, but the animations are generally decent, if not the most fluid going from frame to frame. The fighter's stance and movement are notable for how ridiculous they look. It looks like he's all cramped up. The horseman class doesn't look altogether human, but their actual movement is satisfactory. Icons on the map are simplistic in their rendering, but nevertheless are easy to understand what they are. Character portraits, on the other hand, are more of a mixed bag. Some of the main characters look decent, but they don't do a great job of showcasing a character's personality, and NPCs like certain villagers are borderline creepy, which likely wasn't intended. There's also a fair amount of units that share the same portrait, with minor palette swats, which isn't a criticism, more of an observation. Yet another example of the constraints that the game had to work with in packing everything that they did into the cartridge. The sole shining spot in Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light is the soundtrack. Yuka Sushioko is one of the all-time great composers, and her skill was evident even at this early stage of her career. Her compositions in the Blade of Light are excellent. They do an amazing job of capturing the sweeping scale of this war, and injecting character with leitmotifs that the dialogue really managed to deliver in comparison. There's even tracks in here that are poignant and offer commentary on warfare itself, like each map's victory, which I talk about here, but I wrote quite a lot about it during my Path of Radiant review, so... Look forward to hearing about that in part 2 of that review when it comes out. As well as how awful that game's cover of the same track is. Given how great the game's score is, it's a shame that it suffers for a noticeable crackling and hissing. In addition to the aforementioned emulation troubles, this particular re-release has some rather irritating sound that were not present in the original. <laughs> the silent title screen these problems are present. This game is over 30 years old. There is no excuse whatsoever for this version of the game to have as many problems as it does when it comes to its emulation. Especially when, as far as I understand it, the version that's offered on the Nintendo Switch Online service in Japan works without a hitch. Nintendo, if you're going to release a game for a limited period of time, can you at least make sure that the thing that you're releasing over said limited period of time actually works? I've soiled the good Yukatsuzioko name! Soiled it! Soiled it! Soiled it! This latest playthrough of the first game has certainly made me appreciate the later entries in the series for all the niceties that I take for granted. Take it on its own, this re-release of Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light presents something of a conundrum. If you're a new fan of Fire Emblem, the lack of supports, weak story, frustrating user interface, absence of options, and poor characterization will likely be a deal breaker. And the attempts to smooth out the rough edges of an unspectacular campaign by simply fast forwarding through it in its entirety does not make the proceedings any less unpleasant. If you're a hardcore fan, then you've already played through it, either through ownership of the original, emulation, or via one of the two superior remakes. And while the new localization is largely in line with what one would have expected from a hypothetical release for Nintendo of America in 90 or 91, the story that's being told isn't appealing enough on its own to justify a purchase, let alone to support Nintendo's artificial scarcity. I'm sure by now someone has rushed to the comments to angrily retort, so let me just make this very clear. No, this limited release and supporting it is not going to lead to them localizing more of the currently Japanese-only Fire Emblem games like many are naively hoping for, and not just because they're more likely to remake the older games on the Echoes line like they did with Gaiden. This is Nintendo being exploitative of their properties, plain and simple. They are cashing in on the first game's legacy over a limited time period with equally limited effort, solely because they know that people will laugh up their special edition that costs $50 due to them making it scarce from the outset and impossible to buy after a short period of time. They're not using this as an opportunity to test the waters for a hypothetical Binding Blade localization. They are using this game to boost their fiscal quarter results by fanning a fear of missing out. This is your one and only chance to own the first Fire Emblem game, the one that started it all. Unless you change your region to Japan, in which case it's part of your Nintendo Switch Online offerings. What a way to celebrate Fire Emblem's 30th anniversary. 
people need to stop giving massive corporations like Nintendo the benefit of the doubt, irrespective of whether they like the games that they make. They have always been a soulless corporation whose interests are not aligned with most of the people who buy their games, but many of the recent business decisions have been focused on short-term financial gain that has been to the detriment of their games, and especially games preservation. Once this game is taken off of digital store shelves, no one will be able to experience the original Fire Emblem game without emulating it or owning a Famicom cartridge. And there's nothing that's preventing Nintendo from keeping up with the game as long as the eShop does. It is a deliberate choice on their part to approach their catalog like the Disney Vault to artificially inflate their value. Stop licking Nintendo's boots and making excuses for a massive corporation that couldn't care less about you, I, or the game that they sold in such an appalling state let alone to support Nintendo's artificial scarcity strategy. Nintendo's decision to limit the window in which one can buy the game is indefensible. It is an anti-consumer, anti-preservationist, anti-gaming history move that only serves to benefit them and their shareholders. In a few months, this game is going to be taken off the eShop, leaving it very much like the original as nothing more than a relic. Buying this game is only going to make it more likely that the next major retro release by Nintendo is going to be sharing Switch shelf space for a couple of months. And the only thing more despicable than that is that they'll likely get away with it. The fear of missing out that they've created for the recent re-releases of historically significant games with limited additional features in said re-releases has worked in their favor on two different accounts. Super Mario 3D All-Stars, a game which is being taken down in March of 2021, is one of the best-selling games of the year selling over 5 million copies. That figure is probably going to be closer to 6 million once this video comes out, if not 7 million. It's important to remember that, regardless of whether one likes the games that their developers make, I mean, Fire Emblem is one of my favorite series, that Nintendo is a corporation. This is the company that regularly takes down content on YouTube and try to get YouTubers to join their now defunct partner program, where Nintendo would get a cut of said YouTuber's profits solely because they own the IP a given creator was talking about. The company that made a video game about relationships and try to pretend that gay people didn't exist and said that it wasn't a political statement. The company that dragged their feet on addressing a data breach that saw several other customers' bank accounts and credit cards used to make fraudulent charges. The very same one that regularly prevents their fighting games from being played at tournaments like EVO, among other poor decisions that they've made. In particular, their business practices in the 90s that alienated former business partners like Square and Capcom for several years. Their animosity towards the fighting game community in particular is so potent that when several teams in a Splatoon tournament Enter with names meant to show solidarity to the big house due to the latter being served a cease and desist order for daring to hold a melee tournament online, which is kind of important since in-person events are a terrible idea to hold in the middle of a pandemic. They outright canceled the Splatoon tournament due to said show of solidarity. Although at least this tale ended on a happy note as the community held its own Splatoon 2 finals and raised a prize pool of $25,000 along with an additional $3,000 for charity. Incidentally, do you want to know what the prize was for winning Nintendo Splatoon event? Eshop credit. No, I'm not kidding. After this recording, sales figures for the Blade of Light are not available, and we don't have a date for when it will be removed, but it is on the Eshop's bestseller list, and the physical version appears to be sold out at the few stores that took stock of it. And given the bootlickers that have no doubt rushed to the comment sections to defend their favorite Souls Corporation, this is all just yelling into the void since people are going to give Nintendo a pass regardless of their benign business practices. I mean, I'm being a bit of a hypocrite since I bought it even if it was just to review the game. But quite frankly, if this is the state that a hypothetical Juke Draw duology localization would be released in, with their sublime soundtracks suffering from audible snags and so thoroughly lacking in options? I wouldn't want to see either game of that particular saga tarnished like the Blade of Light has been. Despite all my criticisms of the first Fire Emblem game, it absolutely deserves to be preserved. It is an important piece of gaming history. And it deserved better than this. If you are interested in experiencing an old school tactics title, then I would recommend Nobunaga's Ambition or its various ports, in particular the NES port, over Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light any day. As for those that want to enjoy Morse First Outing, you do have two alternatives, three if you count the manga. Morse no Nonazo, or Mr. The Emblem, is... weird. Half remake, half sequel, this is the most unique incarnation of Mars' initial escapade, mostly due to a number of characters and maps being absent from this particular version. Playing through this Super Famicom remake, called Book 1, is technically a less strenuous experience, and you can jump right into the sequel with Book 2 without needing to play through the first one. 
The chapters in Book 2 also have much better map design, and the story and characters are a lot more engaging. The downfall of Hardeen has become the template for empathetic, more human villains in Fire Emblem instead of deities and dragons with paper-thin personalities from the Famicom entries. That said, it pales in comparison to 3 cs and neither it nor its DS remake have ever been localized, so you'll be relying on fan translations if you don't understand Japanese. Still, it is a better way to play than the original. And if I'm being perfectly honest, the best way to experience Mars' first adventure is to check out the first of the two DS remakes, Fire Emblem Shadows Your Wait. Hear me out. Shadow Dragon is often maligned as one of the weakest entries in the series, which is completely fair. It looks hideous, the lead access guide in chapters is antithetical to the series' core design, and the addition of online multiplayer was just as unnecessary as local was in the GBA trilogy. That being acknowledged, this is still a decent game in its own right. Certainly not the best tactics title of the DS, but it is closer to a modern Fire Emblem game in its design, while still preserving what little worked in the original. With a mixture of minor updates like adding the weapons triangle and pseudo support conversations, to more significant alterations to classes and weapons like the Ballistae that makes them more than just the knight equivalent of bow users. It helps that the story boasts a much stronger script. While the campaign's pacing is still frenetic, it's made better by the additional context and lines given before each chapter instead of the inconsistent info in the original. The character of Marth is also different, but it's a better kind of different. Oh, to stronger framing, and an excellent localization effort from 8.4 that takes full advantage of the new prologue chapters. It paints Marth as less heroic, and more of a tragic figure with his inability to protect his homeland or save his sister, making them a far more relatable protagonist. They also show Marth grow, if only a little, throughout the game. This particular portrayal has a nationalist slant to it that's softened when he sees the innocent civilians on the opposing side of the war. It's not much development, there's still a rather uncompelling lead, but it is a vast improvement over the generic Grand Cracker in the original. The soundtrack has some pitch-perfect renditions of now classic tunes, and best of all, all the maps from the original are included and have been updated to provide a greater bite to the proceedings while still remaining faithful to the original team's intentions. Remember those thieves in Chapter 19 that I mentioned who just stood around while you did their job for them? They actually do what they're supposed to in nabbing the valuable loot lying around, and there's tension and strategy to be found on this map as you try to figure out which room has chests to be unlocked and which ones have hostile foes instead of... this. Her motion items are universal and far less seldom, although disappointing that you can't give your manikeets a massive defense boost, but that's because most of the bugs from the original are nowhere to be found. It's far from being one of my favorite entries in the series, the remake of Book 2 that was never localized is a far superior title. But most of the major problems with the game, like the majority of characters still lacking personality beyond what little they're given when they're first introduced, are ones that are rooted in it trying to recreate the same experience as the original. What Shadow Dragon most reminds me of is the first Persona game and its PSP remake. While both versions of the game share several of the same core problems, the newer version is a far more playable title than the original ever was. Although in the case of Persona, it also restored content coming from the localized release, and Shadow Dragon is not a one-to-one -one rendering of the Blade of Lights campaign even if most of the changes made for a far more enjoyable game. While I cannot recommend any of these three versions of the game on their own, if you are keen on seeing how Mars First Adventure plays out, then Shadow Dragon is the one that I would go with. And now that I have footage of the original in its entirety and in English no less, I am never touching it again after finishing this review. So, happy 30th to Fire Emblem, Happy 30th to all the folks over at Intelligent Systems that have made these wonderful games. Here's to the next 30 years, and let's all just hope that the next milestone is celebrated with a lot more effort than this one was. Until next time, game on, my friends.